And uh, yeah, let's get started. Firstly, I'm excited to welcome everyone to Curiosity's customer and partner product update webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce two of my colleagues and today's speakers. Firstly, George Bundle, Solutions Engineer at Curiosity. Today, George will showcase an overview of recent updates and new features added to Test Modeler. Hugh Price, Managing Director of Curiosity, is also here. Hugh is here today to talk about test data automation and answer any test data related questions you may have. So thank you for joining and presenting today. Okay, so before we get going to all the you know, nice updates, I'd like to give everyone a quick overview of our product update webinars. The key objective of our product update webinars is to keep you, the users, informed and up to date with all the great stuff our developers are doing. This in turn will hopefully help you get the most of our out of our products and give you the chance to talk directly to our developers and other users. Our community of users are extremely important to us and we want everyone to learn from each other. So we believe our product update webinars are the right place for exactly that. Therefore, I want to encourage you to leave questions, talk in the chat and invite your colleagues who might be interested to future updates. Additionally, this will help us shape the future of our products, keep them user centric and make sure we are on the right track. All of this is part of a bigger objective at Curiosity, which is improving the user experience. We hope you enjoy this update and we would love to hear your thoughts and feedback. So please do get in touch with us after the product update. Okay, so on to the updates. Firstly, I'd like to give a short update on our documentation and knowledge base website. We had a lot of feedback on our previous knowledge base site and documentation, which is why we decided to rework the whole website. This new site has a load of new ease of use features and a lot of our content has been reorganized and updated. We're still going through the process of updating and reviewing all of our documentation, but rest assured, we're making huge leaps in producing quality documentation that's helpful and easy to understand in order to make your test modeler and test day automation journeys as smooth as possible. Okay, so let me show you the site and a few of its quality of life features so here's you know our update website <laughs> while you know the updated website does look great the main focus was on improving navigation searchability and usability for our users so firstly i'd like to highlight our help widget this widget provides a few helpful links but it also provides complete access to our knowledge base website documentation all right, so you can navigate through our whole documentation using this widget. And I think the key feature here is that, yes, you can view two articles at once, but this widget is also available on Test Modeler. So all Test Modeler users have instant access to all the documentation that we have without needing to head to our website here. I think, you know, that's a key feature to have for any, you know, tool. Uh, cool. So now I'll, you know, just navigate to one of our pages, which will showcase a range of ease of use features we've implemented. Cool. So here's our quick start web automation page. And here you'll find related articles, which feature on all pages will help you, you know, navigate the knowledge base. Additionally, we have dark mode for dark mode users, the ability to share print documentation, and hover over definitions. So when you hover over specific key terms, a definition will appear that's related to test modeler. If we head over to the left-hand side screen here, and for example, I search by scanner, you can narrow down the pages that are showcased here. Again, ease of use for navigation, searchability. Our main search also has an advanced search capability. So if you go to advanced search, we are. You can now narrow down the search using the categories available in the knowledge base and the tags that we use across knowledge base. If we get back to our page here, you can also see tags are implemented here on the right hand side of the screen. For example, if I quick click the quick start tag, you'll be taken to a page that showcases all the page, all the pages that have the quick start tag. So if you're looking for quick start tutorials, additional documentation on quick start API automation, for example, this is a quick way of seeing it. Cool. 
So I head back now. All right. So I hope this quick overview of the SI and its features has been helpful. You can check out the knowledge base website for yourself by visiting knowledge.qrcsoftware.ie. If you have any feedback, please do get in touch. Okay, but now I'd like to hand over to George Bundle, who's going to provide the latest updates on Test Modeler. So if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen, George. Hey, Brom. Yeah, thanks a lot, man, Tess. Um, can you see my screen? It should be model GPT. Yeah, yeah, can yeah, see. Right. So um, one of the, the biggest new updates uh, for this quarter is our model GPT um, and the ability to create models from text-based requirements using AI. So at the moment, obviously, as we all know, generative AI is massive. It's everywhere. Everyone's talking about it. So um, we thought, you know, to be one of the sort of leaders in the market, let's try and um, implement this within our software. And what it does is it essentially allows you to create models using, um, you know, using the help of AI from sort of boring text-based requirements. So when would you use it? So uh, as, as I'll show you in the demo, right, if you've got a text-based summary of a requirement or even just a list of conditions that you need to create into a model, um, then you can paste them in uh, and it creates a nice model for you. Why use it? It's fast and efficient. It gets you from sort of having no model to maybe getting 80 or 90 percent of the way there. Um, and then once you've created your model using your AI, then you sort of rely on the human element to come through and update use your domain specific knowledge um, and sort of get you that next 10 or 20%. So let, let me show you uh, an example. So just before the session, um, I span up one of our, uh, the, the feedback loop. So on the model importers section, you have model GPT. Now what I've done is I've just pasted in uh, an example requirement for car insurance. So, when we paste that in here and, and say go, it goes away and gives us um, the first attempt at a model. So we'll take a quick look. Um, you'll see, you know, the first attempt is pretty boring, just a sort of straight linear flow, but this provides the skeleton on which we can build and add more logic onto the model. So I paste in something else. If we enter like a, an incorrect username, then we should um, create an account or um, you know, they should be asked to create a new account. Then we can also do something called self-improvement. So there's a button at the bottom here called self-improve, and that will basically ask the model to evaluate itself. And it will essentially then give you a bunch of feedback, as you'll see here. And it will also make some improvements to that model based off of um, what it knows already about modeling. So again, we'll scroll down and let's have a look at the, the second version. You'll see here, you know, we've added a few more different, um, few more different parts, right? There's there's more variety in our model, and it 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 captures a more sort of complete picture of the system. Now, again, uh, we've added some more stuff, some more stuff, until eventually we get the final model, which in this scenario looks um, looks a little bit like this. So, really, it it depends on how you are sort of prompting the, the model GPT, uh, as is the case with any of the other sort of AI tools. Uh, there are kind of good ways and bad ways to, to get an output from this, but over time, um, the AI will be learning uh, and will essentially sort of you know, improve over time and, and give you much, much better models. So where, where do I see people using this? I mean, it's as part of a, a flow that involves uh, using the technology, but then also once you've got this model built, actually reviewing it yourself and making sure that the assumptions that the AI ma has made are correct um, and the business rules that you know should be in there are actually in there. So on a similar note, um, we have uh, a new one called Data GPT as well. So very, very similarly, this allows you to create uh, data lists from text. So instead of creating models as the output, um, you get basically a spreadsheet inside of Test Modeler with the data that GPT has created. So again, if we flip over to here, um, in our import list section, we have an import option for data GPT. Um, and in, in here, I'm just asking it to create some people data for first names, last names, genders, and cities. 
um, I can select the number of rows. So I'll just do 10 for this example. Um, and you also get the option to select the creativity. So I didn't mention this previously, but setting this level um, will give you a slightly different output each time. Um, and, you know, as you get to, to learn the tools, you know, you probably understand which um, which level of creativity is best for your, your particular scenario. So, for example, for the model GPT stuff, I would usually start at a lower creativity level. And then if you need it to, you know, if you're trying to get it to understand something that it hasn't understand, understood previously, then I would focus in on that specific area in the requirement text and push the creativity up quite a lot. And then it gives you more of a chance of, of being able to add that new feature or new functionality um, into that model, or if you're using data GPT, um, into the list. So if I hit import there, we spin up ourselves a job. And basically the output of that job um, looks a little bit like this. So we've got um, some people data. You see it's created a list for people data with different countries, first names, last names, genders, um, and cities. Now, this is a good way to get started. We've also implemented um, data GPT for existing lists as well. So you'll see at the bottom here, I can go in and add basically 10 GPT rows. What that will do is it will analyze those initially, those existing columns and the existing data points and essentially generate similar data um, for each of those for each of those columns. So you'll see it's again looking at oh, OK, we've got countries, first names, last names, gender cities. So we've got 10 rows originally. And if I do a refresh, on this list, what you'll see is that we basically add um, another 10 rows onto this list. Um, and you'll see that it's got either some good data or some bad data. It's missed out, for example, the last name column here. Um, but basically, you get the option to create additional rows um, in, in your existing list, or if you haven't got data already, to create synthetic data using the AI. So those cover the two sort of AI based new features that we've got. Now, the other the other one for more of um, sort of cosmetics um, and uh, I guess a visual more visual approach to modeling. So we have now the options to, to set different font sizes and colors in models. So you can change font size, uh, color of nodes, color of arrows, um, basically anything in the model canvas. So when, when would you use it? So essentially when you want to differentiate different blocks and nodes um, in your model. So uh, I'm working with, with one of our customers who is using it in review sessions to basically define, okay, what, what has changed? Um, so if there's something that's changed in the model that gets uh, a sort of a separate color so that the next time we look at it in another review meeting, we know that uh, from the first version, this is what has changed. Um, alternatively, you can use it to define positive or negative paths. So if you've got, um, you know, a, a positive set of tests and a negative set of tests, um, you can set those subsequent nodes to either red or green, to basically define and give you that visual cue. So let's have a look um, at it in action. So if I go to this model, um, under, so if you click your, your node or your arrow, you'll basically see that you get these different settings. So for example, I can select, uh, this, the text to go bold. Um, if I want to do an arrow, then I can set the color of that arrow. So I'll just go for a nice curiosity pink. Um, I can also set the color for, um, the blocks as well. So we'll go for yeah, a green, um, and as you go, this. This enables you to create a model that looks more visually appealing and serves a purpose in that it helps to break up the model a bit more. So you can use that in conjunction with um, so the pool action types um, and begin to basically you know split up your model and, and create it as more of a, a flow chart that you can share among the rest of your team members. There's lots and lots more. Um, so the dev team have been very, very busy over the past couple of months. 
Um, all of these will be available in the release notes section of um, of our new knowledge base. Thanks, thanks a lot, Mantas, for for reworking that. Um, so if you see anything on this list that looks interesting, um, you'll be able to find it in the the corresponding release notes page. And with that, I'll uh, I'll hand over to Hugh. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can hear you, no problem. Cool. Um, okay, so let's just um, pile on in. Okay, so this is a little bit of a work in progress um, and it's to do with complex messages. We're doing tons and tons and tons of work on um, messages as you would expect, um, specifically lots of stuff to do with the new ISO uh, to, uh, 222 um, and what we what we're sort of you know using we, we're trying to sort of make it much easier for people to be able to kind of understand the structures and build templates and make decisions and choices etc we'll probably chuck some uh, generative AI on top of it as well to make life a little bit easier so let's just uh, pop into the product so uh, let's just move this city bar out of the way you can't there we are um, Okay, so let's go over to Data Dictionary um, and let's look at a really simple one. So this is a very raw structure um, where you have all of the different things that you can do with it. Um, you know, you can edit it, you can add in, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a grid view, which is very flat, but then what we've also done is now add in a diagram view and you can expand it out and then kind of work your way down into the various different uh, structures. Now, if we go and look at uh, maybe one of the PAX messages, uh, let's go find one. And it starts with a B. So maybe PAX 09001. Now, uh, one of the things that you have uh, is, especially with the complex messages, is that you have choices. So um, as you're kind of opening up the structure, there's a little micro help down here. You can kind of work your way down into the structures. And let's go and see if we can find one. And what you'll see is you'll end up with, uh, do, 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 eventually we'll find one, I suppose. Um, you will find choices. Now these choices are basically saying you have a choice between one of these. You can't have, uh, you can't have both. Um, and when you have sort of in lots of different things like intermediary parties, et cetera, et cetera, what you really want to be able to do is to go through and choose the particular choices kind of in one go. Um, if you click on one of the nodes, you get all of the abilities to add in and you know add in your validations, et cetera. Um, so you can kind of do your editing directly from within here as well. Uh, and this will kind of roll out. But initially, it's just kind of a, a sort of much nicer view to be able to understand uh, the complex message structures inside um, the front end. It's kind of part of our part of our initiative to put a lot more visualization in. So that's the first one. Um, okay, so next thing now is, it's actually, a, I'll show you it running on, on files, but actually um, if you, uh, we've kind of put this right across the products now. So if you go in and you're looking at, uh, let's just pick a database. Let's go find, I don't know, uh, maybe. Uh, now, when you run your scan, um, Now, what you'll see now is that we've got a lot more. You can uh, so basically, once you've um, kind of got the metadata, which is the structures, um, what you can do then is say, well, I want to want to do is go and scan and harness as much information uh, as possible. Um, and what we'll do then is, if we go, okay, so hopefully, um, okay, so basically, what you have here is, um, in effect, an enumeration. Um, give me a shout out if it happens again. Um, like so. Now, what you can now do is you can do this also for file structures. Um, we had some initial scanning of files, but when you're trying to kind of build complex files, it's 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 really good to be able to scan lots of messages and pull out, um, gather as much information as possible so that when you're generating uh, the new data, it looks very close to 
you know, your existing test streams or maybe your production schemes, et cetera, uh, schemes, et cetera. So if you look at this one, so what will happen now is we can, in this case, I'm just scanning a specific uh, file that we're going to scan. Uh, and that will go off. And there's all sorts of different things you could do when you're doing the scanning. You could upload a zip file as well if you want, which contains lots and lots of them, or point it at a folder. Uh, and that will go off and execute. What you'll find then, again, move it. Uh, you'll end up with a scan report. Um, and now there's lots of things going on in here. If you're interested in kind of masking or categorization of data, we do tagging, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're also looking for enumerations, which is where we've kind of gone off and said, well, this particular value, um, you know, looks like, um, uh, you know, it has three or four values. So maybe those are uh, things that we can use in drop downs, um, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so that's, uh, that's an imp a big improvement in that. Um, Data pattern analysis uh, activity. This is kind of a big one. It's to do with multi uh, multivariate generation of data. Now. If we go and look at, uh, I got one, let's lose that one. Let's look at this one. Okay, so what we do um, is we will pick up um, an initial, da, da, let's go and find an initial file, data activity files, three, five. yeah. So, so what we'll have is we've got an initial file containing data. Now in the data, we've got um, some kind of uh, what we call dimension data, and then there's a lots of financial information lurking around inside it. Now, what we can do is we, in from inside the activity, we actually just, um, in effect, upload the file to be analyzed um, or attach it. We then scan that data, and what we'll do is we'll, in effect, create a really, really detailed picture of the data inside files. This works for databases as well. Um, and what you're looking for here is, you know, lots of mins, means, maxes, etc. cetera. Um, um, but you can see that the dimensionality is tracked as well. So what does that mean? That means that when we synthetically generate data, so if you if you click on one of the analysis, you say, we've initially had a thousand rows, but I want 10,000 rows of data. Um, and that would then allow me to create data, which looks like uh, has the same characteristics. This is very good for, uh, for performance testing. It's also really good for uh, masking in that it's creating similar data to the production characteristics, which means all your graphs are going to look very similar. And if you look at an analysis here, you'll see market segment, market trading. I'm comparing the original one, <coughs> and Harry's gone off and generated 10 thousand rows of data. Now you will see this is the dimensionality and it doesn't particularly matter what dimensionality we choose. Um, you'll end up with a very similar uh, if we're looking at medians. Now the sum is different because in this case we've generated um, 10 times more data um, but you'll see standard deviation ketosis this is all very low numbers uh, maximum minimums skewness here. So it's keeping the same um, Again, these are low, these are just kind of uh, offsets. So it doesn't particularly matter. Um, I'm going to maybe do all of them. Might take a little while to choose that one. Oh, look at that. Um, but you can see the patterns are very, very similar. So that's um, a, an important feature. What we'll do is we'll probably roll that into our regular data generation as well. Um, so that when we um, synthesize data, you'll be able to say, well, Use a pattern analysis for the numeric data as well, or based upon the characteristics of the data you're creating, go and use that to drive the uh, to drive the data generation. Now, this is a big one, which is we've now kind of uh, completely rethought the way that we do synthetic data generation. And if we go and look at um, one of the activities, so let's just close uh, this one down here. Um, so again, the data activity will kind of uh, take you through. You click on the next up button. Um, and the first thing we do is that when we run these jobs, the way that the data generation works is we code generate um, a VIP flow. And that VIP flow is very sophisticated in terms of the types of data it wants to generate. You know, you can chain them together. You can have event hooks. You can um, invoke data generation for multiple platforms. Um, it may be into an, API, uh, into an API as well as into a database. Now, one of the important things is that we uh, have to manage the DLLs because DLLs are the things that actually communicate. And what we'll do is we'll actually um, 
deal with that for you. You don't even need to worry about it. It just moves it directly up onto the server, puts it into memory. If you make a change, it will just reload it into memory. So that's kind of a, a big deal. Now, um, again, you've got your definition version, which is the data I'm working on. This is the rule set. Um, and if we look at the rule set, um, you can come in and you'll see, what are we looking at? Uh, what's this one? So maybe looking at orders. And you can see here what we've done is we've got all of the normal data editors. Um, here we're maybe looking at, doo -doo, uh, and you've got all of the normal data editors. So you can do it through the front end. Uh, however, once you get into more sophisticated um, uh, data generation, we've actually changed the way that it works inside uh, VIP. You basically open up a configuration file. Um, you'll have all of your uh, pre-processed variables. And then if you click on the table here, we're just generating uh, some data into what we're trying. What we're trying to do is to create some time series data. So um, here we've got a date of entry. We've got an opening position, closing position, volumes, et cetera, et cetera. Here is a bit of dimensionality that we've introduced. And in this case, we use using uh, some complex data to make sure that we cover all the different variations of them. Now there's lots of rules going on inside here. Um, and if you come in here, you will see, uh, you know, we've got our if statements, um, we've got low positions um, and so forth. Um, and one of the ones that we've done here is if you come in here with using a normal distribution, because uh, we wanted to play around with being able to use some of the mathematical functions. Now, you know, you could come in here and do your normal random helper like so, and these are all of the normal functions that we'd use for synthetic data on masking. But you could also come in and say, well, what we want to do is maybe use some of the math functions, maths. Um, and if you click on here and look at numeric um, and generate, you're into all of the different types of data that you might be interested in. Now, in this particular case, what we want to do is just create a, um, a normal distribution. Um, and we created a variable which is just called normal position uh, distribution. We're giving it a high position and low position um, as the as the sort of uh, we've parameterized that up. If we go and look at the actual function itself, um, and then for the standard deviation, we haven't gone very done very specifics. We uh, anything uh, sophisticated? We've just taken the high and low and subtracted by two. Now, if we go then and look, what we've done then is use that normal distribution um, in our closing position like so. Now, once you're ready to go, you just basically say, um, I want to go and export the flow. If you export that flow, that will end up, um, you can end that, that flow will actually end up on the server, because uh, at the moment I'm working on the client. That flow, um, you have, if there's any compile errors, which happens if you've typed in a function incorrectly, that will show up inside the editor and you can just quickly go and fix it. Um, that will pop up over here. And then if you want to run it, you can just literally go in and just click on run and that will run in kind of a, a dummy mode and it will create a preview uh, of data. So that's given me a little preview of the data that I'm, I'm about to create. And I've already got one open, so just close that. But anyway, you get the get the idea. Now, if we go back and have a look at our normal distribution, so what we've done here is just uh, using a bit of Excel, um, we've come in and said, let's go and create a histogram. Um, and here we've got um, some uh, opening. Uh, I think we've picked the closed position was the one with the normal distribution. And all we've done is just added an histogram. And you can see this is the count of the values separated out by range. It's giving the ranges like so. And you can see for these ones in the middle, we've got a higher range of them because we're using the normal distribution inside there as well. So you can get pretty sophisticated in terms of the different types of data. Now, you know, if you think about this uh, in terms of training data sets for things like machine learning and even AI, really, what you really need to be able to do is to kind of, you've got to, you, you can't predict what's going to happen unless you know what's inside the data set that you've created. So you could play around maybe creating some black swans, et cetera, um, and outliers and make sure that the AI or machine learning can actually generate the data with the similar types of patterns. Okay, so that's me. Um, back awesome. to you, Mattis. Yeah, cheers, you. Let me just share my screen. Cool. Yeah, well, yeah, thank you, Hugh. Thank you, George, for those updates. For now, you know, we've got a Q&A 
time. Uh, so if anyone's got questions, please do leave them in the Q&A box or the chat. But while I wait for those, I got a question for you, George. And that question is, these new features in Test Modeler, can anyone access them? And if not, how do people get access to them? Yep. So they should all, so they're all now in the um, the latest couple of versions of, of the software. So if you're an on-premise customer um, and you don't have that model GPT or the data GPT, um, just let us know and we'll be able to do an upgrade for you um, and get and get that those new features in there. But if you're on the cloud um, or on our partner instance, then you will have access to it to all of the all of the features that I showed today. Cool. Thank you, George. Uh, we got here a question from Nigel. Uh, this one's for you, Hugh, but I think I, I can handle it too. But he's wondering if, you know, Nigel could have a separate session and for his team where they, you know, have a little webinar or teaching for steps for introducing a data catalog within an organization or a, a demo on how the VIP can help with discovery build out. Absolutely. Um, I think it's massive. It's all very well having all this lovely cool chat, GPT, et cetera. But um, if, if you don't have good information, um, then it's going to make some very bad decisions. And that's a lot to do with master data management. We've had a look around at the master data management market. And um, although it's not specifically a focus of ours, we've, just, we've actually found out that we're probably better than most of the master data management tools out there. Now, um, a lot of the stuff that we're doing um, is paying off technical debt, to be blunt, which is actually discovering uh, data from data patterns, uh, looking for links between data items to say, oh, this, this is actually the same data item as this, building up those relationships and understanding the data estate. So, you know, there's some basic stuff you can do, which is kind of registering all the structures, you know, putting in links to any documentation, uh, uh, or maybe just you know importing any metadata you have, which might be lurking around in um, in other parts of the organisation, and then creating a central place where people can go and understand data. And that's really important as you move through versions or you have different teams trying to work together where they don't really have time to present lots of information out. They could just point them to the central location. So in terms of putting together a little program, absolutely. Um, I think there's some politics here as well in that you do need uh, people in the organization to really realize the importance of an understanding of data. It is probably the number one thing that slows down um, development of good software to be blunt if you don't understand the, the, the blood that's flowing around inside the system um, and how it interacts uh, then that's really what we're after with the master data management is to try and uh, improve that common understanding across in inside teams uh, intra and um, uh, outer uh, between other teams as well as well as having um, you know a good understanding for the entire organization awesome thank you Hugh. I think uh, another addition just to that, we do have a really cool blog series on test data strategy success on our website. If you want to check that out, that also covers technical debt, data regulations, and much more. Uh, cool. But yeah, we also have another question here for you, Hugh. So a question comes again from Nigel. And he wonders if there's new data types on the horizon that CSI are aware of or that our customers need to know, for example, new database file types. Any thoughts on that, Hugh? They, uh, I mean, they arrive all the time. Uh, you know, we bounce into them. You know, as you as you're kind of working working around, you know, you'll find uh, new new interpretations of data which roll up into a data type. Um, I wouldn't particularly worry too much about the data types. It's more about the kind of business understanding. A data type is just a different way of interacting with a data store at the back end. Um, it's more of how do you overlay metadata on top of that to enhance your understanding. Um, uh, so as they appear, we add them in, you know, I think probably, you know, uh, you know, synthetic data, et cetera. There's so many different data types of pop, uh, popping up. But for the most part, I think it's it's not, something to worry about too much to be honest yeah makes sense thank you Hugh. so uh, i got a question for george and i don't know if you've explored this yet but 
uh, and I can help because uh, uh, we got a question recently from a customer about our model GPT capabilities. And the question is, can model GPT generate uh, models or data in other languages? Yes. So at the moment, it's just just in English, but I believe um, James is already working on that um, and adding the option to have, have different languages um, as, as the, uh, the return. Yeah, awesome. And I, I think I believe that ChatGPT uh, and the AI model uses Google Translate to uh, generate their answers when you do ask for a different language answer. Personally, I've tried it out myself uh, when trying to generate answers in Lithuanian. So it does work pretty well for that. So I'm sure it will work great for generating models and other and requirements in other languages as well. Cool. <clears throat> okay, here's another question then. Uh, I wonder if CSI is looking at introducing any capabilities for testing software and data inputs for people with disabilities. So George or Hugh, can you take one of this? Um, so I guess we're talking about accessibility testing really, right? Yeah. Um, not that I know of. Uh, I don't know, Hugh, have you, have you looked at that recently sorry it's just me sir uh, i mean you know there is a there is uh modeling that you can do for accessibility testing so um you know i think building up models to help people test systems to make sure that they have uh actually used automation to make sure that all the accessibility type uh their rules aren't there there are sets of rules to make sure that the screen actually interacts in the way that you want to do that so i think using the tool to do that um, would be a good idea but we should probably do it ourselves on our own tool um to just double check that we've you know got in all of the different features that uh, make it fully accessible actually now, now, now you say that Hugh. actually I, we we worked with one one of our customers who used uh, sort of visual based testing for their accessibility testing so they used aptly tools eyes um, as a way to basically make sure that their um, the the web pages met the criteria that they needed for the for that specific uh, accessibility requirements. Um, so really, yeah, we I, I guess that's that's one good example, right, of of how of how we would do that. Awesome, thank you, guys. Cool. So, I think. That's all the questions for today. And yeah, so I think it's I think a good time to call it for today. So I'll just like to thank everyone for your questions and for my colleagues for the great presentation today. If you like to carry on the conversation following the partner product update, there are a number of ways you can get in touch. All of these links and the slides will be shared with you in the follow up email tomorrow. If you'd like to learn more or still have questions, please get in touch with either George or Hugh via email. If you know a colleague who might be interested in our product updates, then share the recording and future updates with them. And finally, please follow Curiosity on LinkedIn and Twitter or with our website to stay up to date with our latest updates. Details on the upcoming quarter three 2023 customer and partner product update webinar will be shared soon. So look out for the email announcement for that. So all, I think that all that remains is to be you know, say a huge thank you to everyone for joining and a massive thank you for George and Hugh for presenting today. And I hope to see you all in our next customer update. Cheers then. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.